All right, so uh, one of the common patterns that we look for is the double replacement pattern. And that's what we saw here for this one. So if we do this by a double replacement, we'll have um, H3PO4. H3PO4 plus hydroxide, NaOH. Right, when we do double replacement, we like to react things to completion. That is, H3PO4 has three acidic hydrogens, and those three acidic hydrogens are lost one at a time. So when we lose the first acidic hydrogen, it forms H2PO4 minus. And then we'll lose the second acidic hydrogen, that's going to form HPO4 2 minus monohydrogen phosphate. And then by the time we lose the third one, then we'll finally form phosphate. And so when we do this, we react this to completion. And so what I'm going to do here is um, that's going to dictate what the products are going to be. In this case, I'm going to form hydrogen with hydroxide. Hydrogen with hydroxide is just going to be water and sodium with phosphate. And so I'm going to take this all the way down to phosphate. And so it's going to go to Na3PO4. All right, this is different than what I was saying before with sulfuric acid. With sulfuric acid, you know, we ionize just one of the hydrogens. And so for sulfuric acid, remember uh, we had H2SO4, and then we broke that up into H plus and HSO4 minus. <clears throat> the reason I did that is, is because of water. Water can easily pluck off the first hydrogen on sulfuric acid, but can water easily pluck off the second hydrogen on water? And the answer is no. Water is going to have a struggle pulling the second hydrogen. It's a weak acid. Weak acid is only partially ionized in water. That is, they partially hydrolyze with water. And so we leave this like this. So when I ionize H2SO4, it ionizes into H plus and HSO4 minus in water. H3PO4 is a weak acid and shouldn't ionize in water. Our water would have a hard time plucking off any of the hydrogens on H3PO4 because H3PO4, unlike H2SO4, is a weak acid. Weak acids we just leave as is. However, we're not dealing with water. What are we dealing with? What's plucking off the hydrogens off H3PO4? It's not water. It's well, what's com combining hydrogen with hydroxide. Hydrogen and hydroxide. Well, hydroxide, do you think hydroxide is going to have as tough of a time plucking off the hydrogens? No, not at all. H hydroxide can easily strip all the H pluses off phosphoric acid unlike water. So phosphoric acid is weak acid. We don't ionize weak acids in water, but when it reacts, we are going to react to the completion because we're reacting with the base, in this case, sodium hydroxide. So this is why I say in metathesis, just go ahead and react to completion. We're going to assume we have enough. Now, how much sodium hydroxide are we going to need? Um, we're going to need a lot of it. Right. In fact, we're going to need how many moles of sodium hydroxide to complete this? To balance it, we're going to need three moles of sodium hydroxide. Okay. As long as I have three moles of sodium hydroxide, then it's going to react to completion. If I only have two moles of sodium hydroxide or one mole, it's not going to react to completion. And then we'll form something else. But in this case, it will. And then I'll need three hydrogen hydroxides, that is, three, three waters. And then this is balanced. Did we already do the driving force for this? Yes? What was the driving force for this reaction? One. My name is uh, Alejandro. Oh, name again? Sorry. One. All right, so um, 
Yeah. It, it's not strong, it's just stronger acids. So acid just refers to stronger. H3PO4 is still a weak acid. But it's stronger than what? It's stronger than water. And so this would be our weaker acid here. So we're going from stronger acid to weaker acid. This is our driving force. So we have reaction here. So we have a metathesis reaction here. If we have a metathesis reaction, that's good. We can stop there with this particular reaction. And so this will be the complete equation here. Balance, we have driving force. There's no precipitate. You know, sodium salts are all soluble. There's no gas. And then we go to the ionic equation. The ionic equation, do we ionize or hydrolyze phosphoric acid? No. We only ionize the strong acid. This is a weak acid, so we just leave it alone. H3PO4. Do we ionize sodium hydroxide? Yes. All sodium salts are soluble, and so we're going to ionize it. And we have to be careful. We have to make sure we balance it. That is, there's going to be three sodiums and three hydroxides. And then we have to make sure the charges are correct. Sodium is plus one, hydroxide is minus one. So we ionize the strong acids, the soluble salts, and the strong bases. But water is neither of those. So water we just leave alone. And then all sodium salts are soluble. So sodium phosphate is a soluble salt. We got make sure we balance it and have the correct charges. So sodium is plus one, we need three of those, and we have one phosphate, which is three minus. So this would be the ionic equation, and then we'll do the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation, we look for spectators. So sodium ions don't do anything. And so we can eliminate those as spectators. H3PO4 plus three hydroxide yields three water plus phosphate. The sodiums are there. The sodium ions are still there. Um, but since they don't react, we'll eliminate those just for the NIE. When we check for balance, we just make sure the atoms are balanced and the charges are balanced. So the atoms are balanced on both sides. We check the charge that we have a net negative three on the left and a net negative three on the right. And so that's balanced. If we can do this using metathesis or double replacement, that's better. We'll do it that way. An alternative to this is to use the Bronsted method. Phosphoric acid is a Bronsted acid, sodium hydroxide is a Bronsted base. So we could use the Bronsted method. The Bronsted method we do a little bit differently. In the Bronsted method, the first step is we inventory. So the major species would be phosphoric acid molecules in water. Water is not enough to ionize it, so it just stays as the molecule. This is in water. However, sodium hydroxide ionizes into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Here, I'm not going to balance because I just want to look at reactivity, you know, what's reacting together. And then we have one more species present, and that one more species that's present is water. Water is both an acid and a base. And so, um, in this case, it's a solvent, but sometimes that solvent can react potentially. Dylan? Okay, so from here, what we do next is we consult the acid base chart. And so, let's see. Acid base chart I posted online, but it's nice to have a hard copy of it too. Let me pass this out.
So the first thing is uh, we'll look for H3PO4. The acids are on the left side, the bases are on the right side, and they're um, aligned as, as conjugate pairs. So we'll take a look at H3PO4. Uh, do you see it? What would you categorize it as an acid or a base? It's an acid. It's a weak acid, but it's on the stronger end of the weak acids. Do you see that? Okay. Uh, do you see H3PO4 on the base side? No. Next, we come to sodium ions. Um, do you see sodium ions on the acid side? No, do you see sodium ions on the base side? No. Uh, one thing about bronzed acids, all bronzed acids are hydrogen donors. Does, does sodium ion have a hydrogen to donate? No. And bronzed bases are, are um, hydrogen ion acceptors. So if I have a sodium ion and I try to combine it with a H plus, is that a good combination? I'd form NaH2 plus. NaH2 plus good, favorable? No, it's not a base either. So it's not an acid, it's not a base. If it's neither of those, I put, write an N here. And I, I call it neutral, neither an acid nor a base. How about hydroxide? Do you see hydroxide? What is hydroxide? Do you see hydroxide on the acid side? Yes, some people. No? Take a look near the bottom. Do you see hydroxide? Yeah. So hydroxide is an acid, correct? But what do you know about hydroxide? You probably memorized that hydroxide is a powerful base. And so take a look at the base side. Do you see hydroxide on the base side? Yeah. And so hydroxide is what we call amphoteric. It's both an acid and a base. Um, as far as an acid goes, is it a very good acid? No, it's an awful, extremely weak acid. And so hydroxide preferentially um, is a base. It's a much more powerful base than it is an acid. But how do we know it can't react as an acid? Because if hydroxide reacts as an acid, do you know what conjugate base it forms? When hydroxide loses a proton, it forms the conjugate base Look to the right of hydroxide. Do you know what O2 minus is called? Oh, did you get a sheet? Oh, did, did you get one of these ones? It forms the conjugate base oxide. And so even though hydroxide much prefers to be a base, it could potentially react as, as an acid. It depends on how powerful um, how powerful a base you have around. If you have a super base, then it's going to pluck that hydrogen off hydroxide. Um, how about water? What's water? Neither? No, actually, water is both. Water occurs on the acid side and water occurs on the base side. Do you see that? Now, the thing, the difference between hydroxide, which is amphoteric, and water that's amphoteric, is water doesn't care which way it goes. Water is equally uh, fine going as an acid or a base. That is, it has equal strength either way. All right, so we have three acids. Out of these three acids, which acid is most likely to react? Which acid is most reactive? Well, the acid that's most reactive will be the strongest acid. And so out of those three acids, phosphoric, hydroxide, and water, you pick the strongest. 
we have two choices here. We can just look at the table. In the table, which one is the strongest? Phosphoric or two, you can just think, you know, phosphoric acid versus water, phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid versus hydroxide, phosphoric acid. So phosphoric acid is going to be the strongest acid. The strongest acid is going to be the one that's most likely to react. Now we have two bases. Which base do you, do you think is stronger, hydroxide or water? Do we even need the chart for this? Which one's more reactive, hydroxide or water? In other words, what would you rather have a, a glass of, you know, water or a glass of sodium hydroxide solution? Water. Hydroxide is a strong base. You don't want to be drinking a strong base. So we'll, we'll do hydroxide. All right, these two are the, the species that are most likely to react. Now, in Bronsted, what we do is we just react these one proton at a time. And so it's going to be H3PO4 plus hydroxide. This is going to yield, well, if this is my acid and this is my base, the acid loses a proton. And so we'll end up with H2PO4. What's the charge on H2PO4? Um, zero, neutral. That's, uh, the charge is going to be minus one because we lost an H plus. And then we're going to form H2O. When we do the driving force, what we're doing is we're doing a competition. The competition is between the forward reaction versus the reverse reaction. We want to know which reaction is downhill in terms of energy. Is the forward direction downhill or is the reverse direction downhill? In other words, which direction is this particular reaction favored in? So we're going to compare the two pairs. Now, dihydrogen phosphate, is that an acid or base or both? So take a look at the chart. Is dihydrogen phosphate an acid, base, or both? It's both. But in the reverse reaction, it only acts either as an acid or a base. So if I go backwards here, does dihydrogen phosphate gain a hydrogen or lose a hydrogen going backwards? So if I go from H2PO4 minus and go backwards, I go to H3PO4. So did I gain an H or lose an H? I gain an H. If I gain an H, then that's a proton acceptor. That means it's a base. So yes, H2PO4 minus is amphoteric, but in this reaction, it's only a base. It can't be an acid. An acid would have to lose a proton, and we're not losing a proton. Water, water is amphoteric, but in this reaction, water is not considered amphoteric. Water is considered the acid or the base. Water is the acid. Okay, now we're comparing, you know, which of these is stronger, that is more reactive, less, more energetic, which of these pairs are weaker, that is less reactive, less energetic. And so the way we do that is we compare the two acids. Which acid is stronger, H3PO4 or water? H3PO4, we probably don't even need the table for this. And um, which is um, stronger, hydroxide or dihydrogen phosphate? This one, we might need the table. Take a look at the table. Do you see that hydroxide is a stronger base than dihydrogen phosphate? Yeah. And so it's downhill in the forward direction. We have driving force. And so the driving force is going from stronger to weaker. That's our driving force. Now, it depends on how much hydroxide we have available. If we only have one mole of hydroxide, then we're only going to neutralize the first hydrogen, and we're going to form dihydrogen phosphate. 
If there's more hydroxide present, then we'll repeat this. When we repeat this, we'll add more hydroxide and then repeat it. Which one's the strongest acid? Which one's the strongest base? And then go on. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say et cetera here. But this would be our bronsted lowry Now, when we have Bronsted acid-base reactions, typically we'll just do step one. Later on, we'll do step two, step three. And so we'll just stop here. Although we could extend it and neutralize. Eventually, we'll neutralize all three. Does that make sense? So what was the driving force? The driving force is going from stronger acid to weaker acid and stronger base to weaker base. We want to go strong, high energy, reactive to weak, low energy. So that's downhill. So if we go from the reactants to the products, it's downhill in energy. And that's what we want. We want to go downhill in energy. All right. Um, any questions on this? Let me move to the next slide here. We're going to look at the sodium monohydrogen phosphate. So uh, does, does anybody know this formula for monohydrogen phosphate? It's one hydrogen and a phosphate. If I have one H plus and a phosphate, which is three minus, what's the charge on monohydrogen phosphate? Minus two. That means I need two sodiums to balance out the charge. And so the formula for sodium monohydrogen phosphate is Na2HBO4. And then I'm going to combine that with potassium hydrogen sulfate. What's another name for the hydrogen sulfate ion? bisulfate. And so the um, formula for potassium monohydrogen sulfate is KHSO4. When we look at this reaction, it looks like a uh, metathesis to me, double replacement. It's double replacement because I see the A, sodium ion, B, now, my B, what is my B? Is my B phosphate or monohydrogen phosphate? What is my B here? Phosphate or monohydrogen phosphate? Is it monohydrogen phosphate? It's monohydrogen phosphate because the, the hydrogen doesn't break off so easily. So A is sodium plus. B is monohydrogen phosphate, HPO4 2 minus. What's my C here? C is potassium ions, and D is bisulfate ions. And so in double replacement, I do an AB plus CD yields AD. So this is going to yield AD. Okay, A is sodium ions with bisulfate, so this is going to form sodium bisulfate or sodium hydrogen sulfate. Do you know why I don't call that monohydrogen sulfate? Um, the reason I don't call it monohydrogen sulfate is because there's only one acid anion. If I had dihydrogen sulfate, that would be sulfuric acid. And, uh, Whereas um, monohydrogen phosphate has multiple acid anions. So if I add an H plus, then I'll get dihydrogen. If I add another H plus, I'll get trihydrogen phosphate. Trihydrogen phosphate is phosphoric acid. So I have my B plus C, B. C is potassium, B is monohydrogen phosphate. And so potassium is a plus one. So I'll need two of those for every monohydrogen phosphate. Right. And so if I could do double replacement, I'll do it. And then I'll look for a driving force. 
you see any driving force here? And so the first thing I look for is a pre precipitate. Now the problem is, is all sodium salts are soluble. All potassium salts are soluble because they both belong to group one. Group one salts are all soluble. So there's no precipitate. All right, that's okay because all we need is one driving force. Do you see any gas formation? No. Neither of those are gases. Those are just salts. No gas. Do you see stronger acid to weaker acid? Well, I see acid here. Monohydrogen phosphate and bisulfate are both acids. Bisulfate is a pretty decent acid. But you see it's not changing. We're going from bisulfate to bisulfate. And we're going from monohydrogen phosphate to monohydrogen phosphate, so there's no change. And so there's no stronger acid to weaker acid. And therefore, there is no reaction, no reaction I call NR. Um, but it turns out that's wrong because um, it's wrong because um, metathesis aren't the only type of reaction. What are the other two types of reaction? There are three types of reaction. Metathesis. Lewis acid base, Bronsted acid base, which we'll just call acid base. And redox. And so what, I, what I'm going to say here is there's no re reaction for metathesis, but I haven't exhausted all the possibilities. And so the next possibility might be, um, might be Bronsted. And so let's take a look at Bronsted at the base. From Bronsted, what I do is I inventory the species present or I inventory the solution here. And so um, sodium uh, monohydrogen phosphate is a soluble salt. Soluble salts completely ionize in solution. And so if, if, if this ionizes, I'm going to form sodium ions. And uh, do I ionize the HPO4 2 minus? Should I ionize the HPO4 2 minus or should I leave it alone? Okay, what do I what am I allowed to ionize? I'm allowed to ionize the strong acids, the strong bases, and the soluble salts. So I just ionize the soluble salts, the sodium. So I ionize the H. In other words, is HPO4 2 minus a strong acid? And strong base? No. Um, it's neither of those, so we leave it alone. In other words, water can't pluck off this hydrogen completely. It's too hard, water. In other words, HPO4 2 minus is too weak of an acid to allow hydrogen to pluck off. I mean, to allow water to pluck off this hydrogen. Okay, potassium hydrogen sulfate, that's a soluble salt. Potassium ions break off, but the hydrogen does not. Why doesn't the hydrogen ionize here? Can you tell me why the hydrogen does not ionize? Because we only ionize strong acids. Is HSO4 minus a strong acid? No. We ionize strong acids, strong bases, and soluble salts. So HSO4 stays together as a weak acid, which weakly ionizes. And then there's one more species that's present that's both an acid and a base. Which species is that? Water. Okay, the next step is to label these. So label these as acid and uh, bases. And I'll... Okay, tell me what you got for sodium ions. Yeah, neutral or uh, monohydrogen phosphate.
what did you get from monohydrogen phosphate? Hmm? Weak acid. Weak acid. Anything else for this one? Also weak base. Is it a better base or is it a better acid? It appears to be a stronger base than it is a acid. It's extremely weak acid, just right above water, looks like. How about potassium ion? Neutral. How about bisulfate? Acid or base? Now, is it a better acid or is it a better base? <clears throat> yeah. It's, if you look at the strength, it's, it's approaching the border of strong acids isn't it? So it's a pretty strong, weak acid, one of the stronger ones. Now, when you look at its base strength, it's quite weak. You know, it's near the bottom of the base strength chart. The bottom is the top. It's inverted. In fact, it, it, it shares company with chloride. Is chloride a pretty good base? Let's say, um, let's say I ran out of antacid, and so I, I went over across the street and grabbed a salt packet, you know, from McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or someplace. Would the sodium chloride help neutralize my stomach acid? What do you think? Is chloride, a, is chloride good at neutralizing acid? Let's say I spilled some acid, battery acid, from the car on the garage floor or something. Could you sprinkle some table salt on it to neutralize it? Will that be very effective? Not at all. In fact, chloride is such a weak base, we call it too weak to be basic in, in water. And so if you look at the uh, PowerPoint from uh, yesterday, Um, there's some additional notes on the acid-base chart here. So one of the things I want to point out is this. I can't blow it up. Looks like... You're know, asking too much. I having problems with PowerPoint or my computer flashing. All right, so do you, do you see this? They're too weak to be basic in water. And so these ones are so poor as bases, we don't even really treat them as base. So if somebody asks you, I need some base, and you gave them a, a packet of table salt, is that going to be very effective at all? Not at all. Yeah. They're just too weak. And so what we do here is this.
I shouldn't have done that. All right, back, but I lost some of my annotations. Here. So I'm going to call it an acid and a base, but the base I'm going to put an asterisk here. We really don't consider HSO4 much, minus much of a base. Uh, the potassium was neutral. This was both an acid and a base, but better base. This is neutral. And then we had one more species. What was that one more species missing here on this list? Water. And if water is present, water can always act as an acid or a base. So we have to factor that in. Sometimes it's the best acid, sometimes it's the best base. So just in case, we'll put water in there. Water has a secondary or primary role. The primary role of water is to act as a solvent. All right. Now, which of these three acids is the strongest? Monohydrogen phosphate, bisulfate, or water? Which is strongest? Water is the strongest acid. Does everybody agree? You're looking at the left side. And um, the strongest acids are at the top. So water would be the highest up on the left side? Yeah? No? Out of those three, which one's the highest up? HSO4 minus. Actually, bisulfate is going to be the strongest acid here. If that's the strongest acid, that's the most reactive, and therefore we're going to ignore the other two acids. Because the most likely acid to react will be HSO4 minus. Um, which is the strongest base out of these two? So the base is the chart is inverted. The strongest base will be water or monohydrogen phosphate? Yeah, the monohydrogen phosphate. So the strongest base will be this. And so these are the two uh, species that are most likely to react in a bronsted acid base reaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and react it. We're going to take HSO4 minus, which is amphoteric, but in this case, it's going to be our acid. And we're going to react this with HPO4 2 minus. HPO4 2 minus is amphoteric too, but in this case, it's going to act as the base. It's the best base around. In a Bronsted acid-base reaction, the acid is a proton donor. So the acid is going to lose an H+. plus. So if bisulfate loses a hydrogen, we're going to form SO4. What's the charge on SO4? We're losing an H+. Plus. So the remaining charge on HSO, 
HSO4, HSO4 was one minus, SO4 will be two minus. And we know it's sulfate, so sulfate's two minus. Now, um, HPO4 is gaining an H, so if it gains an H, it's gonna form H2PO4. What's the charge on H2PO4? Yeah, one minus or just minus. That's it. Now, can sulfate act both as an acid or base or just one? Well, sulfate cannot act, cannot act as an acid. Why? It cannot, it cannot act as a Bronsted acid. Why is that? Sulfate cannot be a Bronsted acid because it does not have hydrogen. There's no hydrogen to donate. And so in this case, it, it, it can only act as a base. Whereas um, dihydrogen phosphate can act either as an acid or a base. But in this reaction, it can only act as a acid. And the reason is, is because it's a competition between the forward and the reverse. And we, when we reverse this reaction, then H2PO4 minus loses an H to form HPO4 for the two minus charge. And so this is only a base, uh, an acid, excuse me. Now we have to figure out which side is more stable, which side's less, lower in energy, which side's less stable, which side's higher in energy and more reactive. And so we're gonna compare, let's compare the two acids. Which one's the better acid, HSO4 minus or H2PO4 minus? HSO4 minus. So we call this a stronger acid. Stronger acids are more reactive, higher energy. We call this the weaker acid. Weaker acids are less reactive, lower energy. So we're going from higher energy to lower energy. This is downhill. We want to go downhill. And so this is what we call our driving force. Our driving force is stronger acid to weaker acid. We only need to look at the acids or the bases because of the conjugate relationship. If this is true, then it must be true that we're going from a stronger base to weaker base as well. In other words, it's got to go strong, strong to weak, weak, or weak, weak to strong, strong. It cannot go strong, weak, strong, weak. So is it true that monohydrogen phosphate is a better base than sulfate? Can you verify that on the chart? Monohydrogen phosphate is a better base, stronger than sulfate. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. So we got no reaction for metathesis, but we do have reaction for Bronsted. Acid base. Occurs. So if we stopped at metathesis, then we wouldn't have seen this. But sometimes we don't stop at acid base because there's one more type of reaction we should look for. What's that one other type of reaction? Redox. But I didn't talk about Lewis. I didn't talk about Lewis because Lewis is a bit more complicated. The chart you have on the right side is the strength of the Bronsted acids and bases. But what about Lewis acids and bases? Is there an equivalent chart? And it turns out there isn't an equivalent chart. You know, um, some of them cor correlate, some of them are the same, but others are not. And so for Lewis acids and bases, it gets a bit more complicated. And so this uh, reaction I'll skip for now. You can work on this at home. But um, we're gonna have to start looking at structures like Lewis structures and whatnot. Even for Bronsted acids and bases, for Bronsted acids and bases, sometimes, you know, we can use structural arguments to figure it out because do you think this is a comprehensive list of Bronsted acids and bases? No, there's gonna be a lot of acids and bases missing from there. One of the things they like to do at UCs is they like to put those ones that are missing 
So um, what we can do is we can use some structural, you know. We'll make a good asset. When we think about it, we want houses to be more H plus like. The more H plus like they are, the better. And that H plus is going to deal with polarity. So this is what makes methane. You know, what's the ranking of methane? Do you see what um, the worst acid on your acid card is? What is it? H4. H4, we call it all green, let's say. All green. You know what green is? Let me um, tell you the color coding scheme here. Did I talk about this already? These are electrostatic potential maps. These electrostatic potential maps are generated from um, quantum mechanics. And uh, these are just quantum mechanical calculations. Um, unfortunately, the person who decided the color scheme was probably not a chemist, probably a physicist. Not, nothing wrong with physicists, but sometimes they don't do that much wet lab work. Because um, when we think about red, is red associated with acids or is red associated with bases? Like red litmus. Red litmus is red in acid or red in base? Blue litmus. Is blue litmus blue in acid or is blue litmus blue in base? Let me tell you, red is associated with acid. So if you have acid, red stays red, but blue turns red. Blue is for base. So red litmus turns blue in base. All right. Here it's the opposite. When you're looking for acid, you're looking for blue. All right. All right, that's okay. What about charge? Acid is H plus, right? We want a positive charge. Is positive charge usually associated with red or black? When you think about positive charge, do you usually think red or do you think black? Red. Red's usually associated with the positive terminal, the positive charge. Uh, in the electrostatic potential map, it's blue. Blue is associated with positive. And so it's flipped from what I expect. So maybe it's not a physicist because physicists know about charge and batteries and that kind of stuff. So I don't know who assigned this. But whoever assigned it, um, that's what it is. So when you're looking at dark blue, dark blue means positive. So this is two acids. On the left, we have this acid, CH3CO2H. Do you recognize that formula, CH3CO2H? Close. It would be ethanol if it were COH. Then you'd be ethanol. But it's COOH. That is, it has two oxygens. COOH. It's a carboxylic acid, which is... Eth ethanoic acid, but nobody calls it ethanoic acid. Everybody calls it it's another name for ethanoic acid. I don't know. If I, did I talk about this yesterday? Did I talk about methanoic acid, ethanoic acid? No. What you want to do is um, you want to go through the list. So normally when I get a list of like uh, something like this, I try to name all the acids. So can you name all these acids? Like the top left acid, what is that one called? HClO4. Can we name all these acids? HClO4 is called 
perchloric acid. HI? Hydroidic? Hydrobromic, good. Hydrochloric? H2SO4? Nomenclature is something that's easy to forget, and so what you want to do is you want to review um, nomenclature, chapter three um, from Chem 1A, that would be good. But the next one is sulfuric acid. HCl3 is chloric acid. HNO3 is nitric acid, followed by hydronium. And then this is a weird one. You may or may not know, it's trichloroacetic acid bisulfate, phosphoric acid. Now the one below phosphoric acid is tricky. That one is what we call a complex. Complexes, we're gonna to learn to name in chapter 24. But the name of this complex is called hexa aqua iron three ion, which is surprisingly acidic. You know, more acidic than nitrous acid, which is below it. Less acidic than phosphoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid. And below hydrofluoric acid, we have the first COOH. COOH, a.k.a. CO2H, is known as the carboxylic acid group, carboxyl group. And that's the simplest carboxylic acid. The simplest carboxylic acid is one carbon. Do you guys remember the organic prefixes? One carbon chain, two carbon chain, three carbon chain. Tell me the prefixes. One carbon, the parent chain is called... Prope, but, pent, hex, hept, deca, nona, meth, like methane. Methane's one carbon, meth. And so that first acid there is called methanoic acid, H-C-O-O-H. Nobody calls it methanoic acid. People call it formic acid. Below formic acid or methanoic acid is a two carbon. Two carbons we call eth. And so that second acid there is called ethanoic acid, but nobody calls it ethanoic acid. Everybody calls it acetic acid. And so that's the condensed structural formula for acetic acid. And so um, if we look at this acid here, this is acetic acid. here versus sulfuric acid here. Look how different the blue is between sulfuric and acetic. Do you see that? This hydrogen and acetic acid is much more acid-like than this hydrogen. And so the more blue it is, yeah, and the more positive it is. The more red it is, yeah, kind of the more basic, the more negative it is. Well, methane's green. It's all green. Green. You can see some green here. Do you see the green here? Some green here. Green is kind of neutral. Neither positive nor negative. Neutral. And so methane is not going to be very attractive. If you're a base like hydroxide, are you going to be very attracted to methane? No. Hydroxide wants positive, you know, hydroxide's negative. Hydroxide wants, if you're hydroxide, you're on the lookout for blue. And so here's a green, is green very attractive to hydroxide? No. Here's blue, yeah, this blue is pretty attractive, but there's a more attractive blue. And so which, which, which of these three hydrogens Will hydroxide attack this hydrogen? Will it attack that? Or will it want to attack this hydrogen? Or will it want to attack this hydrogen? Here, which of those three hydrogens will hydroxide want to attack? Well, the most positive one. Which one's the most positive one? Sulfuric acid. So this is why we pick the strongest 
is the strongest or the most likely to react. And so we're going to ignore, we're going to ignore methane. We're going to ignore acetic acid. Hydroxide is going to attack sulfuric acid. And so how do we determine this type of stuff? This type of stuff is determined by things like bond polarity. Do you guys remember bond? What, 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 does anybody remember this carbon and hydrogen? Carbon electronegativity is what? 2 point close, 2.01, 2.5. Carbon's electronegativity is 2.5. What is electronegativity on hydrogen? 2.1. So carbon and hydrogen have very similar electronegativity. Carbon's a 2.5, a 2.1, they're close. And so if they got in a tug of war for the electron cloud, it's going to be kind of a tie. So what we call this, we call the carbon-hydrogen bond nonpolar. Does methane and water mix? No, they don't mix because water is polar, methane is nonpolar. They don't mix. The bond is totally nonpolar. Not only that, it's tetrahedral. So even if it was a polar bond, it'd still be nonpolar. And so we can do that. And hydroxide is a powerful base. So even if methane weren't on our chart, we could kind of figure it out. It's not going to be a very good acid. In fact, methane, nobody thinks of methane as being a, an acid, really. Sometimes, though, we need some structural, you know. There's different ways we can do this. The easiest is if we could just look it up on the acid base chart. But the places like UCLA, UC, UCSB, they don't like to make it that simple. And so um, what they want you to do is they want you to do some structural analysis. So the easiest structural analysis is not these quantum mechanical structures that are generated using like molecular orbital theory. The easiest for us is to just draw Lewis structures. Do you guys remember how to draw Lewis structures? Do you need a computer to draw Lewis structure? No, Lewis structures are pretty easy to draw. And then from Lewis structure, we could try to analyze it based on bond strength, bond polarity, product stability, that kind of stuff. It, it's, of course, it's nice to do this quantum mechanical. If we have a computer, we could do it. In fact, we have computers here. And we used to have the quantum mechanics programs to do this. Um, but we ran out of money, unfortunately. So I don't know if we ran out of money. This school has this school has a lot of money in reserve. I think the this school has like seventy five million dollars on reserve budget. So I think we could afford this quantum mechanics program, although it's kind of expensive. Uh, how much? I'll tell you how much it is because I'm going to go look it up. Um, what was that? <laughs> yeah, 75. I know, maybe 80, 80 mils. Well, anyway, um, how much is it? Uh, let's see how much it is. Um, but Um, actually, I recommend you guys buy it. Are you continuing on in chemistry, organic chemistry or something? Um, what's $7,200 for a single license? $7,200 is worth it? Um, $7,200, but we could get a site license. We used to have a site license or a site license, and then we weren't commercial. We were academic. Was, uh, academic pricing is much better, right? $2,400 academic price. For a single license, so I can buy this for twenty four hundred dollars. But you know, I should I should enroll in some classes because if I register in classes, do you know what the pricing on this is? Let's take a look. Check this out. A single license for a student is fifty dollars. Well, $50 is still kind of expensive, but 
that's pretty cheap compared to $2,400, which I'd have to pay. So 50, for a student, it, it depends on if you're taking organic, this could be helpful maybe. But they have something even cheaper, which I bought, and I have it on my phone. So I have the um, Apple iOS version. I, I think I paid $5 for it. It's not very powerful, but you can still do some stuff. If you have an iPad, they have an iPad version. It's like 5 or $10. But if you're going to spend five or ten dollars, you might think about spending fifty dollars. No, one time, one time. But you aren't going to get the updates. They update it every year. But you know, you can survive with an older edition of this. It's no big deal. Um, in fact, um, with our site license, then we were getting the most recent updates. You know, it just gets faster and faster. You know, calculations. Don't change much. What's that? What you, you can do is you can analyze um, acid strength uh, theoretically using quantum mechanics. And so I wrote a lab for this when we had it in the computer lab. I called it the acid strength lab. And we'd go in there and we'd build all the acids using Spartan. And then we generate all the electrostatic potential maps, and then we get some other data, and then we try to rank them in order of acid strength. So you could do that. You, there are other things you can do. Um, the reason it's so expensive is uh, people use this for like drug, you know, designing drugs or looking at drug interactions. And so this is why like pharmaceutical companies can afford to pay a lot more money. And um, and there are other like cool things. There's another uh, sister program to this called Odyssey. In Odyssey, what you can do is um, you can turn off hydrogen bonds. So let's say you have DNA helical structure. What holds the DNA helical structure together? Hydrogen bonds. So you can just um, turn off the hydrogen bonds. The whole thing collapses into this like spaghetti noodle. And then you can turn it on, and then it just re uh, reforms, which is kind of cool. Let's see. I mean, there are lots of things you could do. Um, you can take a look at it, but I don't know if it's worth fifty dollars. We paid four hundred dollars for the lesson, but then we we got a discount on top of that, so it wasn't quite four hundred dollars per computer, and that's per year because they updated it every year. I, the version for my phone I bought was years ago, so I, I'm still using that for one time. Okay. Well, let's go back to this. So, so. Well, let's take a break now, and then I'll start up after the break. Since uh, we're unlikely to pay, you know, even if it's $50, it's still kind of a lot of money. So what can we do without having to spend any money? <clears throat> Well, what we can do is we can learn uh, or review Lewis structures. You want to review all that? When we review Lewis structures, Lewis structures are based on um, molecular orbital or valence bond theory. Normally, when we do Lewis structures, we, we think in terms of valence bond theory. We, we think in terms of um, orbitals and overlapping orbitals and that kind of stuff. And so you want to review that. You want to review formal charge, oxidation state, all that kind of stuff. And so if you're given, let's say, if you're given something that's not on our chart, you know, it's, if it's on our chart, no big deal. We just look it up. But let's take a species that's not on our chart. Like this. When you look at um, hydroxide versus this, do you know what we call this? One in green here?
This is kind of like methanol, you know, uh, methanol would have a hydrogen out here. Do you guys know methanol, ethanol, pretty much? Um, and this one's called methoxide. So if we compare methoxide with hydroxide, um, what would you think? Are they going to be similar or quite a bit different? That is, uh, let me ask you this. Do you think they're comparable or do you think methoxide is probably a weak base, you know, not one of the strong bases? What would you think? Uh-huh. Okay, it's it's not as strong as helpful. Well, the polarity is going to be dictated by the electronegativities. So when we compare the electronegative, let's just compare the electronegativity of hydrogen here, which is a 2.1, with um, carbon. What was the electronegativity on carbon? 2.5. And what we say about hydrocarbons, like methane, methane's a hydrocarbon because uh, we say hyd all hydrocarbons are nonpolar because they all have nonpolar bonds. They all have nonpolar bonds because the le electronegativities are comparable. So a 2.5 is very close to a 2.1. And so when I look at the polarity of this, it's not all that different. Yes, carbon's a little bit more electronegative. And so it could decrease the negative charge here. In other words, it could suck some of the electron density away from the oxygen, making it less basic. So in that sense, yes, this would be less basic. But in, in another sense, we have to look at what else is attached to carbon. And so here, oxidation states are going to come into play. Can you tell me what the oxidation state of oxygen is over here on hydroxide? I know the formal charges. The formal charges are the same, negative one, negative one. So we got to dig a little bit more into this to figure it out. And so the oxidation, do you guys know how to do oxidation states based on Lewis structures? Your book goes through how to do oxidation states based on formula, but you're gonna to have to learn how to do oxidation states based on Lewis structure. Do you guys remember? Edgar, you remember? Tristan? Rafan, do you remember this? Yeah. Time. Time wipes. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I'm right. Winner takes all. Too. And so the oxidation state is minus two for the oxygen and plus one for the hydrogen. Over here, the oxidation state is minus two for this oxygen, so this is the same. But when I look at this carbon, this carbon is actually going to have an oxidation state of what? Minus two. So when I look at a carbon with a minus two oxidation state, I consider that electron rich because carbon's oxidation state varies from what to what? Carbon can have an oxidation state that goes from one extreme to the other extreme. What are the two extremes? Did you guys um, do this in Chem 1A? Do you know what the maximum positive oxidation state of carbon is? And what the maximum negative oxidation state of carbon is? You can figure out from the periodic table, just by looking at the periodic table. But carbon's oxidation state varies from plus four to minus four. And so a minus two on carbon is considered rich. This is electron rich. So in one sense, carbon is more electronegative, so it's going to suck electron cloud density away from oxygen, making it less basic. In another sense, this is quite a electron rich. This is called a methyl group, and methyl groups are kind of electron rich. They're what we call electron pushers. And so that's going to push electron density back towards oxygen. Carbon and so, in this sense, I expect these two to be comparable. I expect methoxide to be a strong base as well. And, and so we, we expect both of those to be strong bases. And so sometimes we'll have to do some structural analysis. We're going to be doing more structural analysis um, 
as time goes along. So if you don't know how to do oxidation states based on load structures, um, don't worry about it. Or if this doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it right now. Um, for the most part, most of the species are on the chart and we don't have to worry about them. So this is just going into more detail about what I just did there. For Lewis, um, there's no chart for Lewis. This chart here that we have is for Bronsted. What do we do for Lewis? For Lewis, we have to analyze the structures. Uh, there's no getting around it. And so let's take a look at Lewis acid base reactions next. Um, in Lewis acid base reactions, the acid is electron pair acceptor, the base is electron pair donor. And so here's an example of a Lewis acid base reaction between ammonia and boron trifluoride. What happens is this electron pair becomes shared between the two atoms here, nitrogen and boron, and we form a covalent bond. But this covalent bond is a little bit unusual. In most covalent bonds, one electron comes from one atom, another electron comes from another atom. So if we look at, let's say, fluorine. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. And uh, it's less than an octet. It wants an octet. So fluorine is going to do whatever it can to get an octet. It's either going to take an electron or it's going to have to share an electron. Of course, fluorine would like to take an electron from fluorine. But if we have fluorine versus fluorine, who will win? There's going to be no winners here. The only thing that they can do is they can end up sharing. So in this case, fluorine is going to have to share the electron. And then it gets its octet. But here, um, this is a typical covalent bond. In a typical covalent bond, one of the bonding electrons comes from atom A. The other bonding electron comes from atom B. And then we end up with this covalent bond here. In this covalent bond, I have both electrons come from atom A. No electrons come from atom B. So both of the electrons came from one atom. When that happens, you can't tell the difference. It's still a covalent bond, but we name it differently. We call it a coordinate covalent bond or a dative co covalent bond. Dative and coordinate covalent are the same thing, basically. A dative bond. And um, over here, we have the electron pair donor. This is, electron pair donors are base. Over here, we have our electron pair acceptor. That's our acid. And so we need an electron pair to donate. Yeah. But organic chemists are notorious for this. You know, organic chemists don't like to write lone pairs. We need to um, include the lone pairs. So for example, here, fluorine. Each fluorine atom here has three lone pairs. Okay, now this is better. And uh, we should include the lone pairs over here. Why do I need to include the lone pairs? Well, for completeness, for one. Many organic chemists think um, they don't need to do it because they can just look at it and tell the three lone pairs on each. And so when they look at this, um, the invisible lone pairs are visible in their mind. But we should do it. And the reason I should, uh, I should do it is because uh, Lewis Bates is an electron pair donor. So why didn't we use the nitrogen here as our Lewis base? Why didn't we use the fluorines here? Because this nitrogen only has one lone pair. This fluorine has three lone pairs. So isn't that a much better Lewis base? Three lone pairs versus one lone pair? Wouldn't you think the fluorine would make a much, much better Lewis base? And so why didn't the fluorine attack the nitrogen? Why did the nitrogen attack the boron? And why didn't the fluorine attack the boron? And the answer is this. What's weird about BF3? Take a look at that Lewis structure. And can you tell me what's weird about it? This is 3D, by the way, because it's trigonal planar. So they're trying to show it with wedges and dashes. That is trigonal planar. 
But what's strange about BF3? BF3 we call an exception to what rule? The octet rule. It's not the octet law. You know, laws, we wouldn't expect too many exceptions, but rules, we have lots of exceptions to. So it's an exception to the octet rule. The octet rule says it should have a total of eight electrons. It only has a total of six. But you know, it's so easy to fix. I could fix boron trichloride. All I have to do is this. All I have to do is take a lone pair off the fluorine and donate it to the boron. Actually, I don't donate it completely. I just make a bond. And so let's remove one of the lone pairs off fluorine and then make a double bond. And now look at it. Does boron have an octet? Yes. How about the fluorine that donated a lone pair? Now this fluorine is missing a lone pair here, but it does it still have an octet? Yes. So isn't this the best case scenario here? Why don't we double bond boron trifluoride? Why isn't there a double bond there? Because then that takes care of the octet rule. Fluorine doesn't double bond. That's a rule. What's the basis of that rule? In fact, maybe that should be a law. Yeah, basically it's a law. It's two electronegative because um, if fluorine bonds here, we have to look at what? The cost of energy plus um, we look at um, the formal charge. If fluorine donates, what happens to the charge on fluorine? So pretty much fluorine's giving up an electron to boron. So if fluorine gives up an electron, it loses that electron, and now this fluorine has a positive formal charge. Now boron's gonna gain that electron, so now boron, what's the formal charge on boron? Minus. Well, isn't that the same thing we have here? Yes, nitrogen's gonna give up an electron, boron's gonna gain that electron. And so now the formal charge on nitrogen is positive, the formal charge on boron is negative. So what's the difference between this and this? Well, the difference is, is okay, it's okay for nitrogen to have a positive formal charge. But is it okay for fluorine to have it? No, especially against boron. What's the electronegativity of boron? Quite low. And so there's no way boron's going to take an electron from fluorine. This doesn't happen. And so fluorine is not going to share. It can share in this scenario, but this scenario does not generate a positive formal charge. Here, fluorine is sharing, but in this case, fluorine is, is giving away both electrons. Here, it's an even share, one and one. Do you see that? And so the second bond here would be an example of a coordinate or dative bond. And it's not gonna happen with fluorine. Both electrons aren't gonna come from fluorine. And so what we left with is less than an octet. Well, what that means is that means that this is a strong Lewis acid. It's a strong Lewis acid because it really wants an electron pair. And so what's going to happen is this is going to attack, the base is going to attack the acid. And so we have a lone pair. Do you know what the hybridization on nitrogen is here? Somebody tell me what the hybridization on nitrogen is in ammonia. SP3. This is SP3. So we're going to have an SP3 lone pair going here. What's the hybridization of boron here? The hybridization on boron is SP2. And then there's an empty P orbital here. If you recall SP2 hybridization, we're going to have an empty P orbital. So this lone pair is going to go into the empty P orbital but it's gonna rehybridize. Now, um, rather than being sp2 hybridized, the boron's gonna be sp3 hybridized over here. And we form this. This is called an adduct. This is a Lewis acid-based adduct, and that's our product here, the adduct. So we, we try to visualize it using um, valence bond theory with the orbitals, you know, overlapping atomic orbitals, that's valence bond theory. All right, so what makes a, an acid an acid? Well, the more positive it is, 
And so this boron is quite delta plus. That's good. Delta plus. That's what we want. The oxidation state of boron here is plus three, meaning it wants electrons. And then um, what makes a good base? It has to have an electron pair. But not only does it have to have an electron pair, it has to be delta minus. And then it makes it a good donor. And so acids are more positive, bases are more negative. And the more negative, the better, the more positive, the better. All right, let's look at identifying. All right, when we look at the positive regions and negative regions, uh, remind me the color. Positive is blue or red? Blue. And so we see acid regions here, the blue, and the red are going to be base regions here. To properly do this, we're using um, valence bond, but to properly do this, we should be using MO theory. And um, we should be looking at LCAO of atomic orbitals. And when we do that, we look at HSAB, hard soft, hard soft acid base theory. And so electron rich regions are base if they have, they need an electron pair. Electron poor regions are acid, but they have to be able to accept an electron pair. There's gotta be room. BF3 had no problem accepting because there's an empty P orbital. Other atoms might have a little bit more difficulty accepting because they're already full. They already have an octet, but it can still happen. So let's take a look at an example here, carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide, first thing is, this is Lewis acid base, and so we don't have quantum Spartan, we're gonna just do Lewis structure. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna just do bond polarity. You know, we're not gonna do, if there's a formal charge, we'll write the formal charge, but we'll just use bond polarity. Oxygen versus carbon. Which one's greater electronegativity? Oxygen. So oxygen's going to pull the electron cloud towards it and leave carbon deficient. So the negative region with lone pair is considered acid or base. Negative region with lone pair is considered acid or base. Positive region that could potentially accept a lone pair is considered acid. So this is base. This is base. The two oxygens are base. This carbon could be acid because it's positive, but is there any room for another lone pair to, or uh, another pair to come in? There's no more room. But I'm going to show you how. What's going to happen is we can't have more than an octet around carbon. So if another pair of electrons comes in, then a pair will get kicked out. And so I'll show you how a pair can get kicked out. But this is going to be base, acid, base. There has to be some kind of mechanism in which a pair can get kicked out, which we'll talk about. Okay, let's take a look at water. So we aren't going to have an electrostatic potential map. We're just going to generate this using bond polarities. Is hydrogen delta plus or delta minus? Delta plus. Delta plus is going to be acid. Oxygen is going to be delta minus. So um, we have acid, acid two hydrogens, and base. Now, when we think about acid-base reactions, the base attacks the acid. And so the base is going to consist of a lone pair. And so we have two possible scenarios here. Um, scenario one. Scenario one is this base here attacks this acid. Now, really, we should be doing this in molecular orbital theory and dealing with molecular orbitals. 
With molecular orbitals, we need some computer to deal with that. But valence bond theory is much easier. Valence bond theory I call quantum mechanics light. Molecular orbital we call quantum mechanics full version. So we're going to use light version. Light version we can do a lot using paper and pencil. And so the first thing I'm going to ask you is, um, what orbital is this lone pair in here? In other words, what's the hybridization on this oxygen in CO2? SP, SP2, SP3, what's the hybridization on that oxygen? All right, you should review this is chapter 10 and chapter 11. You should review that because it's very useful. This is SP2 hybridization. So we're going to have an SP2 lone pair coming in. And when we described this bond in valence bond theory. What kind of bond is that? So it depends. What's the hybridization on oxygen here? Yeah, yeah. So make sure you review this. Um, this the hybridization on oxygen here is sp3. So in valence bond jargon, we call this an sp3s sigma bond. So yellow, not on track, you know. The sp3 orbital on oxygen overlapping with the s orbital on hydrogen is going to make an sp3s sigma bond. An sp3, okay, so we have an sp3 orbital on oxygen here, and that's going to overlap with an s orbital on hydrogen here. And we'll have an electron in the sp3 and an electron in the s, and then that's our sp3 sp2. Um, in valence bond an theory, a bond is formed by the overlap of two atomic orbitals. What happens if I bring a third atomic orbital? Now I want to bring an sp2 orbital and try to overlap it with the s. Is that going to happen? Can I have two atomic orbitals overlapping with that s orbital? No, it's not going to happen. And so there's no more room. It looks like there's room, but there's no room. There's no room to accept that. And so what's going to happen here is if this sp2 pushes into the s orbital on hydrogen, something's got to leave. And that something that's got to leave are the bonding electrons here. So the bonding electrons, see that light blue. Um, the bonding electrons will leave here. Otherwise, there are going to be too many electrons, too many bonds. And so this is going to happen in sequence. This sp2 lone pair comes into the s, and then we're going to form an sp2s sigma bond, and then these sp3s are going to break, and then it's going to form something like this. This is scenario A. Scenario A is where CO2 acts as the acid or the base. CO2 is acting as the acid or the base in scenario A. Base. Scenario A dead ends. We're going to reach a dead end eventually. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to do the other scenario. The other scenario is where CO2 acts as the acid and water acts as the base. We're going to call this scenario B. In scenario B, an sp3 lone pair here attacks. CO2. CO2 is going to act as the acid. Water acts as the base. Um, but can CO2 have an expanded octet? Is that a rule or a law? CO2 can have an expanded octet. Rule or law? 
is it possible to have more than an octet on carbon? No, that's a law. It's not going to happen. You're not going to get more than an octet on, on carbon. So something has to give. Well, all the orbitals are taken. Do you guys remember double bonds? Double bonds consist of one sigma bond and one pi bond. The sigma bond here is an sp, sp2 sigma bond. sp carbon orbital overlapping with an sp2 oxygen. And a pi bond. The pi bond is going to be p, p, pi bond. Does that sound somewhat familiar? You, if you just review it, you'd be able to see it, basically. So what's going to happen is we're going to come in, we're going to break the pi bond. So this lone pair comes in, it's going to break one of the pi bonds. And so the PP pi bond is going to break, and the electrons are going to go to oxygen over here. Okay, this scenario works. And so what does this lead to? Well, this is going to lead to this. Scenario B is going to lead to um, this water coming in and bonding to the carbon. So now I have this water here, and I created this bond here with one of the lone pairs on water. So the water donated this lone pair. Now it's formed a coordinate covalent bond. This double bond is no longer there, and the pi bonding electrons are now lone pair on oxygen. This other double bond is untouched. So this is still here. How does this structure look? Does this structure obey the octet rule? Now, does this structure obey the octet rule? Yes. Does the structure look good to you? Or does it look funny? It looks funny. What's funny about it? I'm sorry? Yeah, it just kind of looks funny, doesn't it? Well, actually, um, it's funny because of the formal charges. What are the formal charges? The formal charge used to be all the all zeros here, but now there's some charges here. Do you know what the formal charge on this oxygen is over here on the left? Minus. What's the formal charge on this oxygen here? Plus. When I look at this one that's positive down here, that kind of reminds me of what structure. Then when I look at this one on the bottom here, that kind of reminds me of hydronium. This doesn't remind me of water. Water would be H2O, but this one looks more like hydronium than water, doesn't it? And when I compare the acidity of hydronium versus water, hydronium is much, much more acidic. And that's because of this positive charge on the oxygen. It makes these hydrogens much more positive, much more acid. And so this is a, I would suspect this is a pretty good acid here. When I look at this, this kind of reminds me of what? Kind of reminds me of like hydroxide or methoxide, except it's a little bit trickier because this carbon has a double bond here, which is going to weaken it. And so this, can, this is a base. And so do you see that this is a base and this is an acid here? Can you see that? And in fact, this would be a pretty good base because bases should have lone pair and negative charge. Acid should have positive charge. And this, these hydrogens are going to have a high positive charge because that oxygen is positive and it's going to suck electron cloud density away from it. These molecules are not static, they're vibrating. And so what's going to happen next is this. What happens next is we're going to have an 
intramolecular acid base reaction. That is, this sp3 lone pair here is going to get pushed into the s orbital here. As this sp3 gets pushed into the s, we form a bond, and it's going to have to kick these extra electrons out onto the oxygen here. So these electrons come into the s, and then kicks the other electrons out. When that happens, we're going to form this. You recognize this molecule? This is the formula of the molecule, not the shape. The shape is incorrect because in um, valence bond theory, we use Vesper to dictate the shape. But um, you recognize this molecule? Its formula is H2CO3. What's H2CO3 called? carbonic acid. So um, basically, when we have CO2 and water, CO2 and water can react to form carbonic acid. But we know something about carbonic acid. You should memorize that carbonic acid is unstable. Carbonic acid decomposes into what? CO2 and water. So the favorable, the downhill direction is this way. This is the downhill direction. This is the uphill direction. And so there should be no driving force. This is going uphill. But in Chem 1B, we don't frame things in black and white. In Chem 1B, we need to know how far uphill is this. Why do we want to know how far uphill this is? Well, this is pretty far uphill. When we look at it, CO2 and water are way down here. like this, energetically. And then carbonic acid is way up here. Oops. Way up here. So this would be a very difficult climb. No. Here. I kind of made it overhanging here. It wasn't supposed to be like that, but it doesn't really matter. It's just to show that it's energetically unfavorable. But let's talk about energetics. At 25 degrees C, do all water molecules move at exactly the same speed? No. At 25 degrees C, do all CO2 molecules move at exactly the same speed? No, they move at different speeds. In fact, we have a distribution of speeds. At 25 degrees C, what does that distribution look like? And the distribution is a, a plot of the population versus the energy. It has a name. Do you recall the name of this distribution? Yeah, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And it has a shape. Do you recall the shape of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of speeds or energies? Is it a bell curve or what was it? Could you draw the shape of the distribution? You should be able to draw the shape of the distribution. The shape of the distribution is kind of a bell curve, but it has this little tail, high energy tail. Like this. And so at room temperature, the bulk of the CO2 and H2O are residing down here.
Well, both of them, yeah, some of these are more energetic. But there's a small population of high energy. This small population of high energy molecules can actually make it up this climb to the top. It's a very small population. But that small population can actually form a little bit of carbonic acid. The bulk of these will go up a little bit and fall down. Up a little bit, fall down. They aren't going to make it to the top. But a tiny fraction will make it to the top. But they don't stay at the top forever. Eventually, they're going to decompose because carbonic acid is unstable. But as soon as one carbonic acid decomposes, there's a new one that takes its place because can you stop CO2 and water from moving? at 25 degrees C, it's impossible. The only way you can stop CO2 and water from moving is to cool it down to what temperature? The only way you can stop them from moving is to cool it down to, what's the coldest temperature you can think of? Absolute zero. At absolute zero, then forget it. They're not gonna make it to the top. It's not going to be moving. This is called an equilibrium. What's going to happen is eventually we're going to reach a steady state where the ones that are climbing up and the ones that are falling back down are at the same rate. That is, the rate of those climbing and the rate of those falling are equal. And what that means is we're going to have a steady concentration of carbonic acid. And so when there's CO2 present, we're going to react it with water and form a little bit of carbonic acid and it's going to be stable as long as the amount of CO2 is not changing. And so this is what gives our DI water a pH of 4.5. Um, if we don't want a pH of 4.5 for our DI water, we got to um, get rid of the CO2. You know, there's a storage tank. There's CO2 in here. So it's kind of hard to get rid of. And so um, this is what causes our DI water to be acidic with this tiny fraction of carbonic acid that's going to form in there and uh, make it acidic. In Chem 1B, um, we do this quantitatively. So in Chem 1B, I want to calculate what is the population up there? How many do I have? What is the concentration of carbonic acid? I want to know that. I want to be able to calculate. I want to be able to predict it. And so in Chem 1B, we're going to do these types of calculations, you know, how many can make it up the hill, basically. All right, so that's, this is an example of a Lewis acid base reaction. Um, in scenario A, CO2 was the base, it could be a base. In scenario B, CO2 is the acid. And so when people say CO2 is an acid, it's a Lewis acid. Well, it could also be a Lewis base. Depends on what you react it with. Let's look at the next one here. Water and calcium oxide are mixed. So calcium oxide, um, we do the Lewis structure for that. Calcium oxide is a solid. And the Lewis structure for calcium ions looks like this. And the Lewis structure for oxide is just this Lewis symbol. And it's an ionic lattice. So ionic lattice is just extended in three dimensions. It's just the ions packed together in a crystal lattice. Let's say. So we'll go off in three dimensions here. And then we're going to have the surface of the calcium oxide solid. So this is calcium oxide solid. Calcium oxide is not soluble in water, um, as is, like this. But water can attack it chemically. And so let's take a look at water. 
Water is both the Lewis acid and the Lewis base. How about calcium oxide? The calcium ions could potentially be the Lewis what? So we got to do a scenario A and scenario B, B here. So um, up here, uh, the hydrogens are going to be acid, and the oxygen is going to be base. Down here, calcium ions would be electron pair donors, electron pair acceptors. Electron pair acceptors. So calcium ions would be potentially the acid. And oxide could be electron pair donor. It's probably pretty good. That's going to be the base. So I can come up with a scenario A, scenario B here, but I'm not. I'm going to look at the two bases and then ask myself, which one's stronger? Water or oxide? Which one should be a better electron pair donor? Water or oxide? What do you think is going to be a better Lewis base? The oxygen and water or oxide? Oxide is. Oxide is. The oxygen and water is delta minus. Oxide is a full negative two. Oxide is much more negative charge density than water. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do scenario A and scenario B. I'm just going to have oxide attack water. Um, how can oxide attack water? It's locked in a crystal lattice. So what has to happen is the water has to collide with the oxide, and then it can attack. So the oxide comes over here. Now, this is Lewis acid base. Lewis acid base, um, we have electron pair donor. This sp3 lone pair is going to get pushed into the s, and it's going to kick out these bonding electrons here. Like that. And so what we're going to form is this. We're going to form hydroxide. And so this water is going to get converted to hydroxide. And this oxide is going to get converted into hydroxide as well. And then we'll have our calcium ion. And so in other words, if we take calcium oxide, solid, plus water, we're going to form calcium hydroxide. Now, is calcium hydroxide soluble or insoluble? Hydroxides are all insoluble except for group one, ammonium, and calcium strontium barium. So calcium hydroxide is actually soluble, aqueous. So the water is going to attack calcium oxide, make calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is going to dissolve in water. I forgot to write the net reaction over here. Let me go back and write the net reaction. Whereas over here we had CO2 and water. CO2 and water made carbonic acid, H2CO3. This is the reverse of the decomposition reaction shown earlier. Okay, any questions on this? All right, if it's not metathesis and it's not bronzed, then maybe it's Lewis. If it's not Lewis, then maybe it's redox. So let's take a look at redox next. For redox reactions, um, there are different approaches that you can take. One is you could do single replacement, but um, single replacement suffers from what? Single replacement um, has some restrictions. It's not a law, it's a rule. There are lots of exceptions to the single replacement rule, rules. And so you have to be careful. Even if it were a law, you have to be careful. Can you use the ideal gas law under all circumstances? 
So for example, if I were to use the ideal gas law of 100 atmospheres, would you expect an accurate answer? No. I'd expect the answer to be an error. If you use the ideal gas law at 5 Kelvin, would you expect an accurate answer? No. Not at all. The ideal gas law works best at low pressures and high temperatures. Right? Then you can expect more accurate answers. But um, with thermal replacement, there's lots of exceptions that you have to be careful with. Do you think in CAM4 they're going to give you an ideal gas law calculation of 5 Kelvin? Absolutely not, because it'd be a worthless calculation, right? Do you think a CAM4 stu student would know that? Probably not. They'd probably still try to use it, right? And there's nothing to prevent somebody from trying that. Well, the same thing here. You can't apply single replacement to all single replacement scenarios. It just doesn't work. And so we have to be careful. There are exceptions. So instead of single replacement, I recommend using the chart method. In the chart method, we don't have to memorize all the exceptions. The advantage of single replacement is it's much quicker and much easier. The disadvantage is you might get the wrong answer if you don't know what you're doing. Just like the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is easy, but you might get the wrong answer if you don't know what you're doing. Lots of people don't know what they're doing. This is plug and chug. And so um, to avoid that from happening, the chart method is, is advantageous to use because then we don't have to memorize the exceptions and we can um, completely replace single replacement with the chart method. I know the exceptions, so I still use single replacement because it's fast. Combustion, this is in uh, chapter three. Single replacement, I think, was in chapter five. Skeleton redox is in chapter five. Potential diagrams, this is advanced. I don't know if I'm even going to cover it. The chart method is the chart method is is actually in chapter 20, but the problem is is it's chart method in battery applications. I don't want to do batteries yet. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to separate out the chart method from the batteries. And so we're just going to look at chart method alone. Okay. So why do I call it the chart method? I call it the chart method um, because we're just going to use the chart. So do you see the other chart on the handout I gave you? This is the redox chart. And we use the redox chart in much the same way we use the acid-base chart. They're very comparable in use. And so the method is going to be very similar. In acid-base, we inventory. In redox, we inventory. In acid base, we find the strongest acid and the strongest base. In redox, we find the strongest oxidizer and the strongest reducer. In acid base, the acids were on the left. It, they don't have to be on the left. You know, somebody might want them on the, on the right. On our redox chart, this is a redox chart dealing with reduction potentials. And so what they did was they put the oxidizers on the left. Um, do you know what oxidizers? Want what do oxidizers do? What do they want? Like oxygen. Oxygen is a great oxidizer. Oxygen oxidizes metals. So what does what does oxygen do? Metals. Well, they oxidize it. And what what's involved in the oxidation process? Not sharing, not giving, not losing. Yeah, it's taking taking the electrons. It doesn't share, it takes them. So oxidizers take electrons. They take the electrons from reducers. The reducers lose electrons. This is not sharing. In Lewis acid base, it's shared. And so electron pairs donated, but it's not really donated, it's, it's being shared. It's donated into the pool. Reducers donate the electrons and lose them entirely. They no, no longer belong to them. So um, if you're going to take electrons, which species is the most adept at taking electrons? In other words, which species is the most powerful oxidizer on your chart? 
So take a look at your chart and see which one's the strongest oxidizer. Top left. Fluorine. Fluorine is the strongest oxidizer. Does that make sense? Because fluorine is the most blank element. Fluorine has the highest blank electronegativity. And so fluorine is the most electronegative. It wants electrons. So it takes two electrons and forms fluoride. The weakest is what? Well, it looks like weak, the weakest is, is water. Is that right? Water is at the bottom left. But this table is tricky because there are two tables in one. Water is not the weakest. Do you know what the weakest is? Lithium ion. Lithium ion is the weakest oxidizer. Water, you, do you know where water belongs? Uh, where water belongs is take a look at the number on the right. The number on the right is negative 0.828. And so if we fit that into our upper chart, it fits between negative 0.763 and negative 1.676. In other words, it fits between zinc ions and aluminum ions. And so what I did was I, I drew three dots there. Do you see the three dots on the chart? That's where you insert water. And so water is not the weakest oxidizer. Water is um, a weaker oxidizer than zinc ion, but a stronger oxidizer than aluminum ion. And so that's where water belongs. Now, um, there's a conjugate relationship just like the acids and bases. So if I have a strong oxidizer, that means its conjugate reducer has got to be very weak. And so fluorine is the strongest oxidizer, which means fluoride is the weakest reducer. Fluoride is a weak reducer because fluoride does not want to give up any electrons. Once fluorine gets that electron, it holds onto it and it stays. So to strip an electron off fluoride is going to be very difficult. However, to strip an electron off lithium is going to be much easier. So lithium is going to be the strongest reducer, the easiest to permanently remove the electron. And um, fluoride is the weakest reducer. That's the conjugate relationship. Now, everybody doesn't follow this. You know, this is a convention. Some people like to um, put the reducers on the left. Some people like to put the reducers on the left and put lithium at the top. And so they put lithium and then potassium and then calcium and then sodium. And then they like to make something called the activity series. And so they like the reducers on the left, and they like it ranged so the lithium's at the top, lithium's the most active. This is an upside down activity series. Do you see? Lithium is at the top here, the top being upside down. So um, basically, in the redox chart method, we find the strongest oxidizer, strongest reducer, and then combine them. When we combine them, we copy the half reactions. So each of those reactions written there are half reactions. And then we add the half reactions together, making sure the number of electrons lost equals the number of electrons gained. And then we simplify. Then we look for driving force. The driving force is not the same. The driving force is going from stronger oxidizer to stronger and stronger reducer to weaker oxidizer, weaker reducer. This method yields the NIE. So let's just do an example of this here really quick. Sorry to move on here, but copper. Um, what's the formula for copper? Is that Cu, Cu plus one, or Cu plus two? What's the formula for copper? It's this Cu. This is copper metal, so it's copper solid. And then what's the formula for nitric acid? H10O3. Good. Hey, you know what this looks like? Um, I'll tell you what this looks like. It looks like single replacement. A plus BX. If it's single replacement, then that's going to yield AX plus B. Uh, okay, I'm going to do single replacement because it's easy. So I'm going to take copper with nitrate. 
And I have two choices here. I can do copper one nitrate or copper two nitrate. Which one should I do? Copper one nitrate or copper two nitrate? Which one do you think is more common? Copper one or copper two? Copper two is more common. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to copper two nitrate. The one black here. So let's see. Come on. And then B is just hydrogen, and hydrogen is a diatomic element, so it's H2. The hydrogen is a gas. So, oh, I see, I have a driving force. Is the driving force gas formation? I'm going to get bubbles of hydrogen gas. Is the driving force gas formation? And it turns out the answer is no. Gas formation is the driving force for metathesis. This is not metathesis. This is redox. In um, single replacement, we look at the activity. And so we compare the activity of copper versus the activity of hydrogen. And so we need the activity series. Well, I have an upside down activity series here. And so I start off with lithium. Lithium is the most active. And then I work backwards. And I see copper here. And hydrogen here. So which one's more active, hydrogen or copper? Which one's closer to lithium? Hydrogen. Hydrogen is more active. So hydrogen is more active. Copper is less active. In single replacement, we need to go from more active to less active. This is the downhill direction. So the downhill direction is reverse. This is an uphill reaction. This is an uphill reaction, so we say that um, there's no driving force in the forward direction. Therefore, NR, no reaction. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. We expect no reactions. That's why I didn't even bother balancing it. I would have balanced it if there was a reaction, but there's no reaction here because we have no driving force. But it turns out this is wrong. This is one of the exceptions. And so rather than memorizing all the exceptions, do you, what we'll do is we'll just use the chart method. It's correct that there is no reaction for single replacement, but there is reaction for redox. And so what is the redox reaction? So the first step is the inventory. Copper is not a strong acid, it's not a strong base, it's not a soluble salt, so we leave it alone. Nitric acid, is that a strong acid or weak acid? Nitric acid is a strong acid, so we're gonna ionize it. So these are the major species here. And then water, can water act as an oxidizer? Yes. Can water act as a reducer? It turns out water's on both sides of the chart. So we got to factor in water. It's not the greatest oxidizer and it's not the greatest reducer, but it depends, it might be the best. And then we go to the chart. So take a look at your chart and look for copper. Is copper on the left side or the right side or both sides? Do you see copper on the left side, right side, or both sides? Both? Actually, I only see it on one side. Um, which side? The right side. It's only on, on the left side is copper two. Copper two ion and copper are different. And so this is what we call an RA. RA stands for reducing agent or reducer. So copper is a reducer. 
H plus, does H plus occur on both sides or just one side? Yeah, the right side or the left side? So is it an oxidizer? Yeah, yeah, left. It's an oxidizer. How about nitrate? Do you see nitrate? Nitrate's there. On the left side? Yeah. So, but nitrate needs one other species. What other species does it need? H plus. Do you see it's one nitrate plus how many H pluses? Four. And so we need H plus. And so nitrate with H plus is an oxidizer. And then water, water occurs on the left side. It was at the bottom. But does it occur on the right side? Now, water on the right side is a little bit tricky. So let's take a look at water on the right side of the chart. I see it here. I see water here. Do you see that? But I'm missing something. What am I missing? In order to use this water, I need O2. Do I have any O2? No, so I can't use it. If O2 is missing, forget it. How about this water? This water doesn't need anything, right? So I can use this water. So this water is good. But as I go down the chart, I see I have another water here. And this one needs nothing. So I have two waters. I have a water of plus 1.763, and I have a water of plus 1.229. Which water should I use? And the answer is, which water you should use? You should use the strongest. Well, aren't they both water? They're both waters, but the products are different. This one has a product of O2. This one has a product of hydrogen peroxide. The products are different. And so I want to use the strongest. Which one of these two is the strongest? It depends on which side of the chart. If I'm on the left side, I go up. On the right side, I go down. So which of these two waters is stronger? The one seven or the one two? The one two. Does everybody see that? Because on the right side, the strongest is lithium. Lithium is down here. And so I'm going to use that water there. And so basically, water is both an oxidizer and a reducer. So I'm going to label it OA and RA. Next is I have three oxidizers. Out of these three oxidizers, which of the three is strongest? H plus alone, nitrate with H plus, or H2O? Did somebody figure it out? H plus alone is the strongest. That would be the close one closest to fluorine, the highest up. Yeah, the nitrate That's going to be the strongest. I mean, we could just look at the chart here. The nitrate and H plus is here. The H plus alone is here, and the water is here. And so the nitrate and the H plus will be it. Which is the strongest reducer, copper or water?
and now we're upside down. Lithium is the strongest. So which one of those two is closest to lithium? Copper. And so um, we just take the strongest of those. Now, what we do here is we copy the half reactions. And so the nitrate and the H plus, I just copy it from the chart. So it's nitrate plus 4H plus plus three electrons yields NO gas plus two H2O liquid. Okay, and then I copy for copper, but what I have to do is this. On our chart, copper is a product. What I have to do is I have to flip it so that copper is the reactant. So I want copper solid on the left of this. And that, what that means is I'm going to write the equation backwards from what it is on the chart. So I'm going to go copper solid goes to copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons. And then I'm going to combine these two. These are called half reactions. When I combine the two half reactions, I have to look at the electrons. I have three electrons here and two electrons here. The electrons are mismatched. So what I need to do is I need to get them to match. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the common factor six here. So what I'll do is I'll just cross multiply. This is going to give me two nitrates, eight H plus, six electrons, two NOs, and four H2Os. And then over here, I'm going to multiply this one by three. So I'm going to have three coppers, three copper ions, and six electrons. I need to do this because I need to make sure the electrons cancel. And that's critical. The electrons have to cancel. There's six electrons here on the left. are going to cancel the six electrons here on the right. Okay, once I cancel out the electrons, then I'm going to combine the two equations. So I'm going to get two nitrates plus 8H plus. plus three coppers, solids. This is going to yield two NO gas, nitrogen monoxide or nitric oxide gas, plus four H2O liquid, plus three Cu2 plus, copper two ion. All right, then I look, can I simplify anything else? Does anything else cancel? And no, nothing else cancels. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look for driving force next. So when I do the driving force, all right, know that my nitrate and my H plus, this is my oxidizing agent. And um, these half reactions are conjugate pairs. So if my oxidizer is on the left here, that means my reducer must be on the right here. And so nitrate and H plus, this is my oxidizing agent on the left. NO and H2O must be my reducing agent on the right. Okay, over here in this half reaction, I have copper as my reducing agent, and that means over on the right, I have to have my oxidizing agent. So over here, copper is my reducing agent, and that means copper two ions must be my oxidizing agent here. And then I'm looking at which way is downhill. Is it forward or reverse? And so I compare the two oxidizing agents. Which is stronger, nitrate and H plus or copper two? So take a look at the chart. Which is stronger, nitrate and H plus or copper two? Do you see it? Which is it? Nitrate. So this is stronger, this is weaker. So that means this is downhill. And if I did this correctly, because of the conjugate relationship, that must mean that copper is stronger than nitric oxide in water. And you can verify that. Yeah. And so it's always got to go strong, strong to weak, weak, or weak, weak to strong, strong. It's never go, it's never gonna go strong, weak strong weak. That doesn't happen if you do it correctly. And so we have driving force. So we expect reaction. Now we don't do the IE and the I NIE. 
because we, this is already the NIE. This is an anionic reaction. Now, this is the first step. And what happens is uh, the NO can undergo further reaction. NO, when it's generated, reacts with air. And so I'll put one half O2 gas. And this is going to form NO2 gas. And this happens right away. NO2 is kind of an orange brown gas. Um, NO is a colorless gas. And so this is a, a secondary reaction that happens um, right out afterwards. So let's show this. The Lani oxidized copper metal. We're in the demo lab to see Lani oxidized copper metal oxidation state zero. The copper ion oxidation state plus two. The oxidizing agent will be nitric acid, NO3 minus. NO3 minus will be reduced to NO2. NO2 is a brown gas. You'll see it immediately start to form when the nitric acid comes in contact with the copper metal. Now, copper ions, Cu plus 2, are blue. So, now you can add some water to this mixture, and we'll see a lovely blue color of the copper ions and the brown gas, NO2, formed above them in this oxidation reduction reaction. All right, so um, in single replacement, we predicted no reaction. However, there is a reaction, and there's quite a vigorous reaction there um, in which the nitric acid dissolves the copper metal. All right, um, here's some other examples. Uh, we'll take a look at those later. What we're going to do is we're going to leave redox for right now. And we're going to go to... complexes. So for complexes, I have some um, notes here on Canvas. So let me go ahead and uh, under the lecture notes tab here, I'll download my chapter 24 notes. Uh, this is in PDF. I'm going to put that into Word here. All right, we're just going to look at the first part of chapter 24 here. The first part of chapter 24 um, is primarily nomenclature, but we need to know a little bit about the structure. Um, these are a special type of structure called um, complex or coordination structures. Uh, turquoise here, when you look at it, it's kind of a complicated ionic compound. There's a mix of cations and a mix of anions. And all assembled into some lattice. And then there's some waters of hydration. Do you see those four waters of hydration? Does that mean turquoise is wet? You know? Can you squeeze the water out of turquoise like a sponge? Is that possible? No. But you can get rid of the water. Typically, do you know how you get rid of the water? 
you evaporate it. So you just heat it up and dry it off. Because where are the waters in the structure? So if we take a look at, uh, let me see. This is dehydrated copper 2 sulfate. This is hydrated copper 2 sulfate. And the water is trapped in the crystal lattice, typically in void spaces. Do you guys remember all that void space stuff? Octahedral holes, tetrahedral holes, cubic holes. Does that sound familiar? You know, there are gaps between the ions, and water can squeeze into those gaps. And if we heat it up, we can drive the water out. And so those are hydrates. Now. Here, what Werner, this is Werner. Werner won the Nobel Prize for elucidating these structures. But these are like hydrates here. This is cobalt-3 chloride dot hexa ammonia. Hexa amine. This is cobalt-3 chloride penta ammonia. And um, we can fit different amounts. It looks like the max amount of ammonia we can get in there is six moles of ammonia per mole of cobalt-3 chloride. If we have a little less, I mean, we could go five, four, three, two, one, zero. You know. And so it depends on how saturated we make this. And so this is fully saturated, it's yellow. This is partially saturated, it's purple. And typically when we think about structures like this, we think of them in terms of like a hydrate. So this is solid. And so um, this is going to look like something like this. It's going to be uh, COCl3.6 NH3 solid. So one way I could get rid of the ammonia is just heat it up, evaporate it off. The other way I could get rid of the ammonia is by dissolving it in water. Chlorides are all soluble except for yeah, silver, lead, and mercury. So this should be soluble. So this is going to dissolve. A soluble salt ionizes. So what we expect to form is cobalt-3 ions, aqueous, plus three chloride ions, and now the ammonias are broken free from the cage. They're trapped in the crystal lattice, in these cage-like holes. And so now we're going to have the six ammonia. Ammonia is normally a gas, but it's very polar. It can hydrogen bond with water. And so this is going to be ammonia aqueous here. OK, so that's kind of what was expected here. And um, we can test this. Uh, for example, we could test this with what, um, what cation likes chloride? Do you know what cation likes chloride? Barium. Bar well, barium literally doesn't precipitate. What precipitates out with chloride? Chlorides, bromides, and iodides are all soluble, including barium, except for which three cations? Silver, lead, and mercury. So if I wanted to test this for chloride, I can act, add excess silver nitrate. If I want to test it with ammonia, I use something else. If I want to test it for cobalt, I use something else. So if I use excess silver nitrate, do you know what precipitate I'm going to get? I'm going to get silver chloride solid, PBT. And if I have three chlorides here, I should form three silver chlorides. And so this is expected and observed expected and observed. So maybe we can tell the difference between these two using this test. So if I take the cobalt-3 chloride dot penta ammonia or mean, um, and then dissolve this in water, then it's going to break apart the crystal lattice. I'm going to get cobalt ions. 
chloride ions and now five ammonias. There were some empty holes in there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add excess silver nitrate. When I add excess silver nitrate, then um, one of the chemical properties of chloride is it likes silver. It's a metathesis property of chloride. I asked you the chemical properties of HCl. Now, a lot of people just focus on the acid, but chloride also has properties. What are the properties of chloride in HCl? One chloride likes silver. Ions. It also likes lead and mercury ions. Two, chloride, is it a very good base? No, it's an awful base. Three, chloride is actually a reducer, but it's not a very good reducer. And so um, this, we expect to form three moles of silver chloride. So um, three moles of silver chloride are expected, but not observed. Do you know how many moles of silver chloride were observed? Only two moles of silver chloride formed. So if only two moles of silver chloride formed, what happened to the other mole of chloride? It disappeared? It seems to have disappeared. And so this was kind of a mystery. Um, this is kind of a mystery, and then what happened was it turns out that the structure is more complicated. The structure is more complex. And so that's in two definitions. We have, uh, you know, it's complex, yeah. But what happens is this. The ammonia doesn't go into a little hole. Do you know what happened to the ammonia? The ammonia reacted with the cobalt. And so the ammonia ended up attacking the cobalt. What kind of reaction does this look like? Which kind of reaction does that look like? It looks like a Lewis acid base reaction, and it is. And what we form is we form a coordinate covalent bond, or dative bond. And so the ammonia actually becomes bonded. Now, normally when we describe bonds, we can use valence bond theory or MO theory. But in this case, VB theory fails. VB stands for valence bond. So VB theory, um, we don't use Vesper. Vesper fails. And we don't use formal charge um, in the typical sense, you know, of this. So what we're going to do here is we're not going to write it like this. This is going to be weird. We're going to write it like this. The cobalt's going to stay 3 plus even though it has an extra electron here. And the ammonia is going to remain neutral even though it's forming four bonds. When nitrogen forms four bonds, it usually results in a positive charge. And so we leave it like this. And so that's the um, weird structure.
what the Fine. I was thinking for um, Chem Chem One B. I'd like you to review the. I'd like you to review um, valence bond and MO. You know, you don't have to review it too much. Just get the kind of the gist, so you can tell me the difference between valence bond and MO. I'd like you to review hybrid orbitals. I'd like you to review like um, valence bond theory. You know, a bond is formed by the overlap of two atomic orbitals. I'd also like you to review um, some stuff on like electrolyte um, properties. You know, when we're doing um, inventories, we just assume that you know the strong electrolytes dissociate 100%. But is that assumption accurate? And, um, or, you know, the weak electrolytes don't dissociate. We just leave them together. And no, that's not totally accurate. Yeah. And so if we were to go back and, and take a look at our book, um, there's a section in our book, 14.9, that you should take a look at as well. Fourteen nine. Fourteen nine deals with um, um, ionization. It's it's more in depth, but gives you a picture. What we're going to do, at least initially, is we're going to ignore all that, and we're going to completely ionize the strong electrolytes, and the strong electrolytes being the strong acids, strong bases. Soluble salt. Kind of stuff. All right, so why don't you guys try some? Um, we don't have that much time left, but why don't you guys try? Well, I'm going to stop here for chapter 24. We'll talk more about this, what's going on with the structure tomorrow. But for right now, why don't you try some of the, these reactions here? This one here, solid sodium amide is mixed with water. Um, nomenclature is another one that would be good to review, but do you recall what um, sodium ion is? Yeah, no problem with that. But how about amide? Have you ever heard of amide? So let me tell you what amide is. The amide ion is NH2 minus. You may have seen this before. In fact, if you've gone through the chart and tried to name these things, you've seen it before. And so this is amide. When we do inventories, you know, it's solid sodium amide, but solid sodium amide, is it soluble in water? Yes. And so in this kind of thing, there's a sequence of steps that we use here in order to um, do this particular problem. So sodium amide is going to be NaNH2 solid. And then we're mixing this with H2O liquid. And then we want to find out what's going to happen here. When you look at it, is this double replacement metathesis? No. Is this acid base potentially. So what we're going to do is we're going to inventory this. But when we inventory, this is solid. And so there's two, two ways of handling this. One, for solids, we can just say, okay, there's going to be sodium ions in the solid phase and amide ions in the solid phase. That's one way of dealing with this. But it's a solid, but it's water soluble. So what's, the first thing that's going to happen is the sodium amide will dissociate or ionize in water. 
And so if we have solid here and we're adding water to this, we expect the sodium amide to dissolve. Aqueous. Now sodium amide is soluble. Now it's a strong electrolyte. Strong electrolytes ionize in water. And so we're gonna form sodium ions and amide ions in water. Okay, then um, you can take it from here, plus water. Where would you take it from here? So anyway, um, try this. Uh, I think we, we only have five minutes left, so I'll stop here, stop talking. <laughs>